What's going on guys and welcome to another Doctor Who classic review. Today I'm going to be reviewing the first Doctor William Hartnell story, The Sensorites. This is an episode, a story from season 1, from the first series of Doctor Who. Um, so yeah, I was, I was interested in looking at this one. From what I've heard, this is one of those stories that really kind of has the curse of the Hartnell era. Which is the episode one's really good and it kind of fades away. It's a six-parter that really doesn't need to be a six-parter. So I went into this one with, you know, decent hopes. I thought, you know, it could be decent, it could be not. I didn't really have any particular mindset in my mind. Um, so yeah, I was, I was interested to see what this would be like. Anyway, this is The Center Rights by Peter R. Newman. The Doctor and his companions land on a spaceship orbiting a distant and mysterious world where a human crew lie frozen somewhere between life and death. The planet in the sense is in this is the sense sphere home of the sense rights beings of immense intelligence and power unable to leave the doctor and his companions must deduce the sense rights intentions are they friendly hostile or frightened and what is the deadly secret at the heart of the sense sphere so there's the little synopsis for the sense rights there pretty nice little synopsis on the back of the dvd um so yeah like i said I, I was pretty interested going into this one i'd heard kind of mixed things about it so um yeah anyway let's get started with the cast so we start with William Hartnell as the first Doctor, and yeah, he's, he's pretty good in this one. Um, He is very much his season one self. The first Doctor in season one especially was quite grumpy a lot of the time, would kind of yell at his companions a bit too much, and you know, he is a bit like that here. He has a couple of moments with Susan, um, and I think with Ian as well, where he's, he's kind of just telling them off, and yeah, sometimes you can kind of... It's kind of like, yeah, I can understand why he's doing that, but other times it is a bit much. But generally, I think William Hartnell does good here. He does have plenty of good moments, and generally, he's a good Doctor. So, um, yeah, there's nothing really bad to say about the first Doctor here. He just, he is very much the season one first Doctor, which I don't think is the best version of this Doctor. Um, but yeah, he's still good. Carol Ann Ford as Susan Foreman. I actually like her in this episode. Now, that's surprising because... Pretty much every episode that I've seen so far with Susan in it, I've said that I don't like her. She screams quite a lot, and generally just a lot of the time doesn't get a whole lot to do. It's just kind of there for, yeah, she's smart here and there because she's also from the same place as the Doctor, so she has little things that she does there, but she's kind of just in the background and the Doctor doesn't really let her do a whole lot. And there's a little bit of that in here, but she plays against it, saying to the Doctor that she's not a child anymore, she can take actions for herself, although I think some of the actions she did take were pretty stupid, but we kind of learnt about that in the episode as well, you know, these actions that you're making, you need to make sure you're making the right actions, and you know what, she doesn't have any screamy moments in this one, she actually has a lot of character stuff in this episode, she's probably the best companion in this episode, which is a big thing for me to say, because I generally don't really like Susan, um, but yeah, I think she's actually really good in this episode, honestly one of the standout parts, so um, that is definitely a positive. Jacqueline Hill as Barbara Wright, she has her good moments at the start of the episode, at the start of the story, first couple of parts, and like the last part, she does quite a bit. In between though, she's pretty much forgotten about, um, she kind of gets left on the ship while the others go down to the Sensphere, and really doesn't, she doesn't really even appear again until episode 5, previously not showing up, what, episode two or three maybe so there's a big chunk in the middle where she's really not present at all but um yeah for what she has she's good and then William Russell as Ian Chesterton is also good here as well I like him more and more every time I see him um he has a bit in here where he gets sick for a while that's a nice little bit and um yeah generally Ian there's nothing ever really bad to say about Ian all right so let's get on to the good and the bad starting with the good the sensorites can control people I thought this was a pretty cool thing. They're basically telepathic um, in a kind of way. They can control people's minds and basically make them do things and make them fall asleep for God knows how long and do all this weird shit. They basically take over their minds and they, the humans cannot control themselves. I think that's a really interesting concept, um, especially for the time as well. So, um, yeah, interesting little start. You know, it's, we pretty much knew this from the start that they can control people. It got kind of, you know, delivered very well in that first part. The first part of this story, to be honest, I'd actually say the first two parts are actually really good for this one. Um, I know a lot of people say it's Curse of the Hartnell. Part one's really good and it slows off. Personally, I'd say that part one and two are actually really good, and then it kind of starts slowing off. Once they get, once they go to the Sensphere, I think it slows off quite a lot. But um, yeah, parts one and two, pretty good. And yeah, the way the uh, Sensorites can control people is really cool. 
Barbara and Susan using their minds to resist the Centaurites. So yeah, basically, if they just think enough, um, they can kind of stop the Centaurites from getting into their minds, and I thought that was quite nice seeing Barbara and Susan doing that. So that was cool. Um, the Doctor threatening the Centaurites to get the TARDIS um, lock back, because the Centaurites cut the lock out of the TARDIS, which I thought was an interesting thing because the TARDIS is supposed to be this almighty thing that nobody can get through the doors, but they just managed to cut the lock off. I'm guessing the shields weren't up. Doctor, you forgot to put the shields up. Um, yeah, I, I thought, although this Doctor, I think, does get a bit too angry and aggressive towards companions and stuff sometimes, when he does it to the villains and the monsters, I do think it's quite nice. And I like how he was trying to be reasonable. He was doing it in a very angry voice. But he was trying to be reasonable, and that's very Doctor-like to me, so I really liked that moment. Um, Susan not wanting to be treated like a child, I thought that was really good. Some more awesome character development for Susan. I thought the decision for her to um, go with the sense rights was a little bit of a strange decision, especially when you consider that I'm pretty sure she wasn't actually being taken over, like her mind wasn't being taken over. She could resist that really well, um, so she just kind of did it for some reason, I don't know, it just seemed, I know it was kind of to, because they said we'll kill everyone if you don't come with us, but surely she's smart enough to know that that's probably not going to be the case, um, so yeah, I thought that was a bit strange, but her then talking to the doctor and saying that she don't want to be treated like a child, I thought that was all a really good scene. Ian getting the sensorized disease, nice little thing in there, we have a lot of things like that in, a lot in classic Doctor Who to be honest, where one of the characters gets a disease and they're kind of put off action for a couple of episodes. We've seen it quite a lot, especially in 60s Who actually. But um, I think it's good for Ian here because it's he actually still has a decent amount to do. He has a, a lot of dialogue and still does a few things while he's still sick. So um, yeah, I, I quite like that as a concept, although I think it was a bit of a, a random thing. You know, it was a bit of a padding thing. They just kind of chucked that in to the middle of the episode just randomly because, I don't know, they needed this to be a six-parter and they didn't have enough content for a six-parter, so they thought, let's put this disease in here as well. Didn't have a whole lot of, kind of, relevance to a lot of other stuff. Um, but yeah, it was a nice little thing, I guess. Um, the Doctor finding a cure for the disease, I thought was cool. Obviously then, because some of the sensor rights were working against the others, um, and those sensor rights destroyed the, um, the cure, um, but they managed to find more of it anyway, so Ian was all good, but um, yeah, I thought that was a whole nice little thing there. Susan talking about her home planet. Um, obviously, at this time, we didn't know the name of the Doctor and Susan's home planet. Now we know that it's Gallifrey, although Timeless Child, but um, yeah, um, she talks about the red skies and the silver leaves on the trees, and it's just cool because that is, especially the red skies thing, that is a thing that has always, you know, the continuity is perfect with that because Gallifrey's always, throughout its whole history, had red skies. And I don't know if this is the first mention of this. I imagine it probably is because this is fairly, this is still the, fir the first season. So um, this might be the first kind of um, mention of Gallifrey, although not by name, of course. We wouldn't know that until, well, way into the third Doctor's era. Um, but, um, yeah, I thought her talking about Gallifrey, or her home planet at that time, um, was actually really interesting. Finally, for the good, Barbara using the Sensorite telepathic technology to talk to Susan I thought was cool. So, like I said before, Susan could, she was kind of telepathic somehow, which is a bit strange. I mean, why was the Doctor not? But at the same time, we know that the Master can hypnotize and everything. The Doctor can do a little bit of that, but, um, I think it's just general different Time Lords, different Gallifreyans can do different things, and Susan, she was a little bit telepathic, so um, I like that Barbara could uh, talk to her using the technology um, to guide them through the uh, the kind of underground maze sort of sewers area, or whatever it was, water, ways, I don't know, I don't think it was sewers because that was their drinking water, but um, it basically looked like sewers, but um, yeah, I thought that was all pretty good stuff. Now on to the bad, there are a few things to talk about here. First of all, I mentioned this before, Barbara is pretty much forgotten about when everyone else goes to the sense sphere. She literally, because she gets, she says, yep, we're gonna, well I think the doctor says, you can stay behind here, we need somebody to stay behind the ship. And once they leave the ship, Barbara's literally, she's not forgotten about because she does get mentioned, but she isn't on screen I don't think, from what I remember for like three episodes, and then all of a sudden she's 
on the sense sphere because they brought her down and she's just there now. Um, yeah, I do feel like she kind of, although I do like that Susan got a lot more to do in this episode, I think they've really pushed back Barbara a lot. And this is another one of those things, three companions, we've seen it in the new series of Doctor Who, it is a bit too much really. Um, there's always one, there's pretty much always one that gets forgotten about this time. On the whole, for, for generally, even though she does get stuff to do at the start and the end, most of the time Barbara seems to be a bit forgotten about here. Um, also, the end feels very abrupt, it literally just ends, they find the people in the underground water area, um, they think there's a war going on or something, the sensorites show up, they kind of put one of them to sleep, and there we go, it's all done. It really, especially because it was six parts and because it was quite slow in the middle, I felt like the end was far too abrupt, it, way too abrupt. Um, and then finally, six parts is too long, should only be four parts. I think if this was a four-parter and they kind of fleshed out the end a bit more, because I think they could they could have got rid of some of the crap in the middle, maybe some of the disease stuff, I think keep a bit of it in there, but get rid of some things, maybe some of the bickering between the two kind of groups of sensorites, I suppose, get rid of some of that, um, and make this a four-parter, get the end a bit more kind of glued together and a bit with a bit more substance and this would be a really good episode but sadly for a six-parter yeah it's just it's way too dragged out all right so a rating for the sensorites i'm gonna give it a seven out of ten now that's an average rating for me a seven out of ten is kind of the average score i was gonna give it a 7.5 but the end did make me put it to a 7, because the end was so abrupt, I thought, hmm, I'm just going to stick it on an average scale, because generally, even though it is slow in the middle, I, I'm still, I still kind of felt hooked most of the time, there was at least something going on, there was quite a lot of dialogue, but most of the dialogue was to do with the plot, and it was generally quite interesting, there were bits here and there that weren't, but most of the time there was stuff going on, and although it was slow, and it definitely should have only been four parts with a bit of tweaking, um, I still actually quite enjoyed it, so yeah, a 7 out of 10 for the sense rights. But anyway, that's going to be it for this video, guys. Thank you very much for watching. If you enjoyed, please go ahead, like, and subscribe. Follow me on Twitter, link is in the description, and I'll see you guys in the next video.